Are we live? Yes. yes. This is Dr. John Brinkman. I'm here with Mike. It is 8 o'clock, and this is the Dr. Brinkman Medical and Surgical Hour. We're talking to you from Orange Park, Florida. I'm a general surgeon with North Florida Surgeons here uh, practicing, and, and just want to give a shout out to everybody and welcome to the show. How you doing, well, Mike? Thanks, John. Great to see you, and happy yeah. new year to you. Yeah. So it's a, you know, it's a nice time to talk about uh, a lot of things in medicine, and we can make New Year's resolutions and talk about things and absolutely so what's on your mind today well sir i'd like to discuss um the topic well actually two different topics i want to get to a one uh first of all which is um probably a, a painful thought to a lot of males um and that's uh you know maybe a sore subject to a lot of guys and that's vasectomies uh-huh yeah okay do you do you perform many of vasectomies you know i don't perform that many right now in my practice you because, have done them? but i've done you know hundreds of them is it what are the pros and cons of having a vasectomy well i guess you, you gotta think in terms of uh you know in terms of the couple right and uh you know there's obviously two parts male and female and the females get tubal ligations uh, for their sterilization procedure and, and the male aspect is a, is a vasectomy. Now when you look at the, the two procedures certainly a vasectomy is a much simpler of the two because uh, it can usually be done under local anesthesia usually a, a urologist or a surgeon or even sometimes family practitioners do the procedure pretty quick you know it takes you know less than 30 minutes to do well, so it's an outpatient procedure? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As opposed to a tubal ligation for the female where you actually have to uh, uh, put an instrument into the abdominal cavity, you know, get down to the pelvis and actually uh, ligate the tubes. So in terms of... So it's painful. Well, yeah, it's painful. Uh, but I suspect that probably more girls get tubal ligations than males get vasectomies. I'm not sure if I have any data on that, but that's what I suspect. I've really never, I mean, I've heard of a hysterectomy, but I've never heard of a, a, a tubular, <coughs> an actual woman getting a vasectomy. Why would that even come into play? I mean, is there certain reasons? For well, it? women, it's, it's a, they have the tubes, the fallopian tubes. Yeah. And so, and so, um, and that is uh, the tube that connects between the ovary and the, the uterus. And so for a sterilization for a girl, it's a tubal ligation, which means they ligate tubal the ligation. Tube. Obviously, hysterectomy will provide the same benefit because removing the uterus will also prevent a pregnancy from happening. But So those are the two different procedures. Now, your question is pros and cons. Well, yeah, are there certain reasons why somebody should actually medically get a vasectomy or too less I mean is there something ever come up health wise that really you have to have this done or is it pretty much a choice well I think it's a choice I mean I, I suppose in theory if, if a person has a genetic disorder and they don't want to pass it on or, huh. or you know or, or something like that or just say you know just have enough, enough kids have enough kids but you know there are situations where uh, a person has a, a genetic abnormality in their genome and they just don't want to have any children to pass it on um, and I guess that would be really about the only medical reason I could think of for a vasectomy or or your um, but you know from the male standpoint it, there, there's really no problems of side effects with the vasectomy it doesn't affect the male is it, is it reversible well it, it is you got to consider it a permanent thing okay. but but it can be reversed and, and that can be you know, technically challenged because the the vast airframe is a very small tubule, um, and uh, and it can be repaired. It usually requires some you know microsurgical techniques to, to, and it's not always successful. Oh, really? So there is there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to reverse it. If you oh, absolutely not. And that's wow. why if a male's going to have a vasectomy, you're going to have it. You better you better you make sure certain <laughs> that you don't want to. Yeah. 
Wow. So occasionally a guy gets a vasectomy, he's happy with his marriage, and something happens, marries a younger girl or something, and she wants to have kids. Gets wants to have kids, you never know yeah, what scenarios so can come into play. A lot of things happen. Well, there's, you know, there's a lot of guys out there that are actually <coughs> planting seeds in girls that they probably shouldn't be, and, <laughs> you know, they vasectomies are are a good thing in a lot of ways to save a lot of taxpayers money with these kids that don't have dads. They you know, that's the thing that I look at too. Oh yeah, that's, that that gets into the whole this cultural and sociologic yeah. discussion about uh, you know, the breakdown of the family in the United exactly. States. And, and you know, I think it is a big problem. You know, there's a lot, I of, do. A lot, I, of, a lot of um wedlock births and uh, and, uh, and, you know, I think kids need to have a father. Absolutely. Yeah, that's something that does bother me out there. You know, there's there's dudes out there that just don't care and don't even think about it. And they have no desire to even raise that child. And, you know, I, I don't know. There's really no solution to that. I mean, I don't see. I mean, you can't go around sterilizing people. Right. You right. know, so, you know, what is it? Is it the moral fabric that just in our culture now to where I mean I guess there's been you know kids that haven't had dads throughout history but it just seems like it's more and more prevalent every day to me yeah and more acceptable you know that that, that more I think there's a, a, a stigma in years past where you know if a girl had a child out of wedlock there's a stigma on that yeah and maybe there's a, a stronger obligation for the the male to marry that person to, to support the child but it seems like that's deteriorated and and I don't recall the exact statistics. I but, wonder. I uh, wonder if, if they had they passed some law to where if you back child support, if you've got multiple children, you're going to be ordered by the court to have a vasectomy. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that should be some kind of uh, issue that uh, uh, to to uh, to account for their actions. You know, there has to be some consequence. There's no consequences. Right. Yeah, that would be a little bit draconian being <laughs> from our standpoint of the government. But, you know, maybe it'd be one of those things where, uh, you know, you tell the person pay up or this is what happens. You know, yeah, you know, now, there like, should be some type of ultimatum as far as I'm concerned. Because and maybe that would open up some of these young guys' eyes in the next generation growing up, you know. You know, and the thing is, is I think that it it shows a bad example for those kids too and find out you know that these kids grow up they have brothers and sisters from people they don't even know <laughs> oh yeah i think it's a recurrent cycle yeah you know a child raised without a father and and oftentimes the cycle gets restarted when that boy exactly. impregnates a girl and he's because not around there's no either. consequence for the yeah. action and then i think we unfortunately we uh live in a country where there's a lot of entitlements where you can Sometimes there's an incentive not to get married, I think. You yeah. know, you can get more benefits from the government. And so uh, I'm, I, I'm, I've heard of people saying, well, I'm not going to get married because they'll reduce the amount of entitlements I get from the government. So we're better off. Better off not getting married, married to where yeah. you'll lose those benefits and lose that financial yeah. income that, that they depend upon. You know, it's it's such a uh, strange thing to me when you, you get on one topic that's sort of a lot of guys, but, you know, the second means I know my dad had one, you know, and uh, I, he had five kids before his, so I well, think he was, was, was ready to have one. To have one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty common nowadays. Isn't it's, it? it's like I said, it's a very simple procedure, you know, very low risk of complications. Um, pretty is it, is it affordable for the average Joe to? Oh to yeah, afford? yeah. Like I said, it could be done in in a urologist surgeon's office. Like I said, some when I was in in medical school, family practitioners were doing that. I'm not sure if they get that same training now, but you know, it just takes about 30 minutes and uh, pretty simple procedure. You know, just require a little local oh. anesthetic. I mean, usually, there are different ways to do it, but typically it requires uh, an incision, maybe a sonometer uh, in the scrotum. You know, the mm -hmm. tube that we grab, cut out a little section of it, suture it, you know, keep it from growing back, and, uh, and, uh. And remember, there's no guarantee they can reverse this. Right. <laughs> and, and also be aware that there's also a failure rate with it. It probably it's, happens. Oh, wow. You know, there's a small chance that the, uh, you know, the tubes can somehow grow back together. That may not work. Right. 
And uh, one would slip on by. <laughs> right. Or there could be some accessory bath step runs. The main bath step runs, you know, the real hard tubule that the surgeon can feel. Uh, and occasionally there can be some microscopic tubules that the surgeon can't see or feel. And, uh, and typically it's recommended to get a sperm count, um, you know, after, after the procedure just to confirm. Uh, after a vasectomy is done, you know, there's enough sperm in the system that will last, uh, you know, anywhere from 8 to 12 ejaculations. So, you know, you have to have that, you have to practice some birth, form of birth control in that period and then get a sperm count just to verify that you're sterile and, <coughs> you know, as far as, you know, does it affect the male's sexual function, it doesn't. Okay. You know, the hormone levels are the same. Although, I've, I've heard of men, you know, having maybe a psychologic or psychiatric issue of, you know, now being sterile. Does that affect I could sexuality? imagine. I could see that. Yeah. I could see it really messing with the guy's mind, you know. It's like, am I more of, less of a man now? Right. But it's purely psychologic. It really has no effect on the amount of semen a male produces because most of it is produced, uh, uh, you know, from the prostate and other areas. So, um, so low risk, you know, pretty simple procedure to be done. And well, I tell you, this is something, you know, I've, I've thought about and I think, you know, a lot of guys don't like to talk about it and, or even don't even like to think about it. Yeah. But it's something that's out there and there are maybe come a time in your life to where, you know, um, you don't want any kids anymore, and is that the, really the best way to go? Is 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 or you know using regular conventional? You know, I guess you'd save money on going to the CVS. You know, yeah, it can be reversed, <laughs> right? You no know, guarantee it can be reversed. It can be, but um, There's you no got to look at it work. that it's a, it's a permanent form of sterilization. Wow. You ever think the society will come to that? Is there a possibility of, of oh, like forced sterilization? Forced sterilization, or not forced, but but um, a, a, a consequence <laughs> to one's actions due to possible overpopulation? I don't know. That's just I'm throwing it out there. You know, I don't think in this country that'll ever happen. You don't think in this country? I don't think so. But I, you could see in other societies, or other governments, where there's much more government stronghold of people that they could force things. You know, like in China, they, Interesting. Have, they have that one-child policy. Y that's right, that's right. You can yeah. only have, but they don't force them to... Right. There's a lot of economic penalties. Economic, so there is a consequence to their actions if they decide to have more children due to their overpopulation. So they Exactly, exactly. But then they created some other problems where, you know, in that society, you know, males are, are preferred over females. And so now they have. Uh, oh wow! You don't even think yeah. about that. And and they've had issues where, say, you know, the family they're going to allow one child, and they prefer having a son over a daughter, because the son, you know, will stick with the family, stick with them, and so help support them in their old age. You know, the daughter gets married off, and she's usually with the male family, and uh, uh, the. So there, there's the, the stimulus for those people to have a male child. So if they know they're going to have a female, they'll you know give the baby up for adoption or abandon the baby, that's or sometimes terrible. even just have an abortion, you know, just because of gender. Just because of gender. Yeah. That's so, just so that's, that's sad. Out. Yeah. I mean, I could not imagine. I've got two daughters. You know, I I couldn't imagine being faced with that choice there. Oh boy. Yeah. You know, that's. <laughs> Thank God I, I live in America. I mean, this, this, you know, we may have our problems, but in my eyes, we are the greatest country in yep. the world and the most free nation. And you know, and don't we always stay like that? You know, we got yes. some challenges ahead. Absolutely, we got a, a big deficit, a big debt. You know, so we got uh, there's some challenges for this country. Well, you know, I I, I look at it like. Um, it almost seems to me in a lot of ways there's not as much opportunity as there used to be for my kids growing up. It's, I think it's a little bit tougher in one essence, but in another essence, the way technology is today, I think kids, if they just realize, I mean, I think a lot of Americans are spoiled. They don't realize the, 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 the resources that we have here available that you, as long as you, you know, 
take advantage of those, there's a lot of things you can do in your life and make a great living not having to go out there and punch a clock every day. Oh, absolutely. You know, you know there's more opportunity in one way, but there's other opportunities are failing. You know, a lot of jobs, a lot of people are being replaced, you know, by new technology. Mm -hmm. And I think people need to learn to adapt to that. Now, do you think one day there'll be uh, just a robot that'll come in and do a vasectomy? You just lay down and then he zaps it out and that's it? I, I don't think so. I don't think oh, robots are going to fight for it. I not trust something. Like that. That. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of sci-fi freaks, man. <laughs> I mean, would you, would you want a robot operating on you? Well, actually, they, well, you know, I think that it's getting towards that. And they have that, I've seen on a documentary where they have robotics that they put into the, the uh, uh, it, it, in the battlefield, in the front line, so somebody that needs to be, have surgery, and a robot will have him go in there. The robot will actually perform the surgery, but the doctor will be controlling him remotely from a different location. Yeah, I mean that that technology is already there. You know, we have robotic surgery where, um, and I even know how to use the robot at the really? Orange Park Medical Center. Cool. We have a robot it's called the Da Vinci. Um, oh wow! And it's it's pretty neat technology, but it it still takes somebody to place the instrument into the patient, you know, still requires a, a somebody proficient in surg surgical techniques. Um, but, you know, there's, you know, if, if say, an uh, operation is being done and all of a sudden there's some active bleeding going on, you know, especially in a wartime you, scenario. you got to know what to do. Yeah, yeah. A robot wouldn't about, be able to catch all those scenarios of, of what, right, right. unless you had artificial intelligence that could kick in. You know, yeah. I mean, there's just so much. I, I love robotics, quantum technology, the physics, the whole, you know, I, I really love it. Plus, I like the Big Bang Theory, too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you ever watch that show? I don't watch it. I, I, I'll just think of the Big Bang Theory. Oh, no, you never watched watch that it. show? You've got to watch it. You know, I've watched, because my son's really it's a fan of it. It's yes. so, yeah, I've seen. I've um, seen it. So, anyway... Has your loan been sold multiple times to other lenders? Were your loan originators New Century or Countrywide? If the answer is yes to these questions, we believe you may have a case against your current lender. You can exercise your right to validate your loan. All lenders must produce the documents required by law to prove ownership of the loan. This is called validation. We at AmeriDocs Process prepare the documents you need to gather evidence showing the loan is invalid. This means you, the homeowner, cannot get a clear title. You have the right to challenge the mortgage note to quiet the title in the court of law. Give us a call at 1-800-296-1477. 1-800-296-1477. That's 1-800-296-1477. We will advise, consult, and educate you. You will be able to receive the compensation you deserve due to the negligence of the lenders involved. Visit our website, www.ameridocsprocess.com www.ameridocsprocess.com That's www.ameridocsprocess.com Current news stories reveal the truth. Watch the video showing that lenders have been exposed by 60 Minutes for Mortgage Fraud. Knowledge is power. We are in the middle of a mortgage meltdown. It is your obligation to yourself to use the last means of defense to get to the truth of this matter. Give us a call. 1-800-296-1477 one 296 1477 1-800-296-1477. Tell them that American Hearts Radio sent you for a 10% discount on your investigation today. This is Johnny Van Zandt on American Hearts Radio, dedicated to release Sergeant Bo Bergdahl. America POWA in Afghanistan. Let's bring him home. God bless our men and women fighting for our freedom. American Hearts Radio Entertainment Network. I just want to thank everybody for tuning in and watching our show tonight. I really enjoy doing 
uh, these segments with you. I know we've had a lot of fun yeah. last oh, yeah. year, and it's been very informative. And I've, it's it's a great way to educate and have fun at the same time. And um, I was talking to you earlier. Our next topic I'd like to talk about is uh, I was actually went to the hospital like I was telling you earlier, and they say I had they believed I had passed a kidney stone. Now, is there any way to tell? I mean, I was in extreme pain. My I had to have the paramedics come get me. I could not walk from the waist down. Um, you know, I do have a hernia that I'm dealing with right now that I have to get taken care of. But once, I mean, everything, when everything was said and done, they told me that he believed I had passed the kidney stone. And that had happened a, a time before, but doesn't you actually, don't you actually have to pass a kidney stone for it to, them to believe that you may have? I mean, how does that work? I, well, I, I guess the, the question is how do you diagnose the presence of a kidney stone and and the, the and first thing is the, the symptoms of it and typically the symptoms are pain on the right or right or left side. I had extreme have nausea, I started vomiting, yep. pain yep. shot from my back all the way around to my front of my belly yep. on my right side and then the whole my whole waist was gone. That was yep. it. I mean I was down for the count. Yeah. Call so, the paramedics. So the symptoms are consistent with it. You had pain in the flank radiating yes. down, maybe even to the scrotum or yeah, testicle yeah, area, yeah. and uh, associated with nausea. Um, did you notice any blood in your urine? Uh, it was urine in my stool. Blood in your stool? Yeah. Because that usually doesn't fit for kidney stones. Well, usually they said I had some polyps or something in my colon okay. I've got to take care of. Okay. But that doesn't have nothing to do with that. Probably not. Okay, good. Yeah, but, but, but then it can comes across as like, okay, are we certain you have kidney stones? Because there's other things that can cause, you know, that type of pain. But let's just focus on the kidney stones. Uh, but your symptoms, I think, were consistent. Nausea, the pain, um, and and how long did it last for? Oh, for at least, a, it lasted for at least a good hour or so. Good hour. Before okay. the, well, actually, it was a product, yeah, when it first started, it it, it kind of I got a little pain in the beginning of the day. I was okay. kind of you know trying to shake that pain, yeah. but, you know like the kind of uh, aggravating uh -huh. pain, and then you know and it just started aching me more and more toward as the day went on. But then I actually went to sleep and then I woke up and I knew something was wrong and I was so nauseated and I, I told my girl Joy please get me something I got yeah. to and then it was. And then it just escalated and escalated yeah. and escalated until it was just unbearable. Yeah, and any fevers? I no chills? Felt it, yes. Okay. So those are all symptoms now. The, the way to diagnose the kidney stone, um, you know, one is noticing blood in the urine is a, is a tip off. But probably the procedure of choice is a CT scan without contrast. Yeah, they did a CAT scan. And, and that's pretty reliable in identifying kidney stones. Did it see one? They, they didn't tell me well, they just believed I passed one is what okay. they told me. So I suspect that they had checked a urine sample, yeah, um, a urine and, sample. and probably saw some blood in there okay. and then didn't see the kidney stone on the CT scan. That's fairly so specific. they don't actually have to physically see the stone to know that you passed one? Or how do you pass well, it? Well, I, I think they're just making like dissolve? Well, the majority of kidney stones will pass on their own, you know, especially mm -hmm. the small ones. If they're you know less than you know four or five millimeters, they'll just pass spontaneously, huh. and then and then it, they may only wow. see the signs like a blood in urine, and then you probably start feeling better, right? Uh, the pain went away. Yeah, after you gave me a pain shot, and and that's really the treatment is pain medications, and and most times kidney stones can be managed at home, you know where you yeah, you they drink have plain water. Yeah, they gave me some nausea medication um, to take home, which I really didn't use that uh, uh, not much because I didn't have much nausea after that and then um, they gave me Vicodin um, for the pain uh -huh. for about a, you know about a week to almost two weeks supply and uh, well no it's actually not not a two weeks supply heck it was only less than a week so I didn't have any I mean after about four days I was feeling pretty good four or five days afterwards uh -huh. yeah but I still was sore and all and uh, so I had to take that Vicodin, they told me once every six hours, and one pill. 
So I, you know, stayed on that, and by the time it was empty, you know, that was it. I really don't have much pain. I still have a little aching mm -hmm. and a little soreness, but I can only roll over. Like when I'm sleeping, I can only roll on one side because it seemed like if I roll on the other side and apply it, that pressure would just bother it. Uh-huh. So. so, but a CT scan is a great test because it also excludes some other things. A lot of times, you know, I'll get called from the emergency department where they think a patient has a, has a kidney stone. They do a CT scan and, and they actually find appendicitis or maybe a gallbladder problem or, oh, wow. or some other thing. So if your CT scan was negative, they couldn't find any other explanation and maybe some blood in the urine. They, they probably just made the assumption that, yeah, that was a kidney stone that's passed. And so now the question is, you know, how do you prevent this from happening again? And Yeah, well, I've, I've been drinking a lot of water. A lot of water? Right. Uh, I, I stopped uh, on sodas, um, you know, very little of that. Uh, yeah. I had cut down on coffee, drinking coffee, so much coffee, maybe one cup instead of three or four. Mm -hmm. Or five, but um, and um, but other than that, I, I, I cranberry juice, cranberry pomegranate juice, I've been drinking, mm -hmm. and um, that's pretty much it. I'm having, yeah. I don't know what else to do. No, no, those are the right things. The majority of kidney stones are calcium type stones, and uh, they they probably did a blood test on checking your calcium level or if you had some abnormality. Um, with your parathyroid gland is, a, is something yeah, that can cause yeah, a blood test story. Okay, and then uh, and so I mean, I, yeah, I mean they did. I mean I was in pretty a lot of pain, right. and they were I, yeah they they did put a I mean, they did do a blood test. But the key thing is to stay hydrated, and uh, and hopefully you won't have a problem. Although significant risk that you could get another kidney stone, and uh, there's some other studies they'll do on if they if you ever have a kidney stone that passes, they can analyze it. And determine if this is a calcium stone or an oxygen. Do you ever stone. have to do surgery to go in for kidney stones? Occasionally, you know, and, and that's done by a, a specialist, a urologist, who also most commonly does a vasectomy as well. But there's some different procedures that um, in the in the kidney, if there's a stone in there that's obstructing, or there's evidence of a urinary tract infection, or um, you know, the pain is just unremitting. Yeah. You know. Some evidence of that. No matter what, yeah. yeah you then, go in. then they could do a lithotripsy, <coughs> which means they they shock it. Lithotripsy. Lithotripsy. And then, and that's a procedure where you fire sh sound waves, and it just kind of shocks the uh, kidney stones where they dissolve and they'll pass on their own. Uh, and then there's pr procedures where they'll actually put a uh, uh, put a scope in the bladder and um, and they and then actually put a, another instrument up in the ureter. You know, the ureter connects the kidney to the bladder, and so sometimes that Ooh. stone will get caught in that ureter, and that can cause some just excruciating pain. Wow, and they can go and, and, and relieve this, or pull out the stone that way, or put a stent in, and, and some different things like that. But generally, the, most kidney stones will pass on their own with just pain management and rehydration, and those, and those techniques in time. Well, so basically what I'm doing is the right thing for prevention for it to happen again is stay on the right course. Yeah. Stay, I mean, I, I've heard that so does Mountain Dew, actually. I heard that a lot of people have told me that, yeah, I've had those kidney stones, man. That's like almost like having a baby. You know, the pain gets so, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what, I've never, I mean, I've felt a lot of pain, and it was almost like the amount of pain I felt when I had my appendix rupture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... Unbelievable. So it was worse. Your appendix rupture or this? The kidney stone? I think the um the appendix rupture definitely. Uh -huh. Okay. Definitely. But it. kidney stone pain can be pretty bad too. <laughs> I mean it's, it's pretty equal. <laughs> I don't want to have to deal with well, I don't have to deal worry about the appendix yeah, appendix no, anymore. It's gone. So I just have to maintain myself in my life and try to stay healthy. And that's what we're trying to do here on American Hearts Radio yep. with John Brinkman. Um, on Brinkman's uh, medical and surgical uh, radio and video show. Um, it's my pleasure, John, being here with you. And yeah. I thank you so much. And uh, we'd like to thank our military and veteran veterans that have served and our and uh, our troops that are out there fighting for our freedoms right now. So we can do what we do here on American Hearts Radio. 
And I'd like to give a shout out for the Common Threads campaign. Uh, go check them out on the website. Donate. They uh, help those guys, men and women that are dealing with PTSD, whether it be the police department, uh, police officers, firemen, and our soldiers that yeah. are coming home. And welcome to the show. We'll see you next week. That's right. God bless. Thanks.